Hello YouTubers, welcome back to another Tesla vlog with me, Adam Well Informed. So I considered doing my video on a four year cost comparison between my Tesla Model 3 and a BMW 330e PHEV for this week's video, but I decided to delay it again as I thought it would be more useful first to cover the topic as to why I picked my electric Tesla Model 3 over a hybrid slash PHEV like a BMW 330e. It wasn't just cost or environmental factors that ruled it out for me, there were some other reasons that deterred me away from purchasing a hybrid. So I thought it would be useful to share my own experience as to why I jumped over that hybrid step and straight into a Tesla Model 3 full electric car. It would have been convenient for me to go to a hybrid, but for me, it just wasn't as convenient as you think. Before I go into this, I'm not trying to alienate anyone here. Maybe you'll agree with my thoughts, maybe you won't. I know this won't convince everyone, but hopefully my ownership experience with an electric car will at least help some of you skip that choice too because ultimately these hybrids are designed to be stepping stones into EV ownership. Along the way I'll even explain the main technical differences between hybrids and break down the technical jargon for you too. So literally this video is for anyone looking to purchase a new car and you're not sure whether to get a hybrid or an electric vehicle like a Tesla. If you don't know that I do this, I actually break the video down to sections so you can easily go back or switch to watch the section you want to watch the most. It's pretty neat if you want to convince a friend or a partner that your next electric car has to be a Tesla without them having watched the whole video, especially if they're only going to be interested in a certain section. So let's get into it. It's no secret that governments all around the world are legislating the introduction of low carbon and zero emission cars. Some jurisdictions even want to ban the sale of new internal combustion engines altogether. For example, here in the UK, as of 2030, you will not be allowed to purchase a brand new internal combustion car. So strictly no new petrol or diesel cars. In addition to this, PHEVs will be banned from 2035. Norway is seen as being even more ambitious. By banning both plug-in hybrids and conventional petrol diesel cars by 2025, so before buying a new car, it's important to understand what the rules are in your state or country as your decision could have an impact on what you purchase and its future residual values. So let's assume you're a consumer in the UK and you're in the market for a new car. You're asked by a dealer if you're interested in purchasing a BEV or a plug-in hybrid or a KEV. But what the techie jargon are they going on about? BEV is generally an exclusive female name probably over the age of 32. However, it also stands for battery electric vehicle. So these are pure electric cars and are exclusively battery operated. So typically we are looking at all Tesla cars, Porsche Taycan, the Mustang Mach-E, VW ID3 or ID4, just to name a few. PHEV stands for plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. As per the name, these cars are a combined mixture of a standard, mainly petrol engine paired up with a small battery. A combination of both petrol and electric. Commonly, you'd get a 20 to 30 mile advertised range of electric together with your petrol operated miles. So the cars you're typically looking at here are a Toyota Prius, BMW 330e, Mercedes A-Class 250e or a Volvo XC60 Recharge. Finally, Kev. If a dealer is trying to sell you a Kev, you probably want to avoid this as Kev is commonly an exclusive male name and it is not actually a motor vehicle, so you probably want to run to the hills at this point. You can also get a self-charging mile hybrid, but in my eyes, these just don't even count as hybrids. I will have a small but little rant about these later. Moving on, it's widely reported that the biggest consumer concern about battery electric vehicles is the provided range, or commonly known as range anxiety. I totally understand that. So how do you measure range in a electric vehicle? With a fuel tank, you'd measure the storage of fuel in liters or gallons, depending on where you're based. The capacity metric for BEVs are kilowatt hours. So the bigger the kilowatt hour, the bigger the range of the car then. Well, similarly to gas or petrol cars, just because you have a bigger capacity battery doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get more miles. This is where efficiency comes into play. If you step on the accelerator hard or your car is extra heavy or super cold outside, these are just a few reasons why your fuel efficiency or your miles per gallon will be lower in your petrol or diesel vehicle. Battery electric vehicles are no different and the same rules of efficiency apply to electric cars, except you're not using more fuel, you're using more battery power instead. How do you compare the cost of refueling and charging then? You'll be well aware fuel gets charged per litre or gallon, but for a battery electric vehicle, 
we are charged per kilowatt hour. So a real basic metric would be to times the tariff price of your electric by the battery capacity of the vehicle. So using my own situation there as an example, my battery capacity is about 50 kilowatts. So I pay just 5p per kilowatt hour of electric used when I charge my vehicle. This means I pay just £2.50 or $3.50 for circa 270 miles of advertised range. If you're using a public charger, you will likely be charged per kilowatt hour too, unless it's a free charger, though in some states in the US, they are charged by the minute instead. Now at this point, I'm expecting you to say 270 miles. That's not near enough for what I can get now. I can get more in my ICE vehicle and way more in a, in a plug-in hybrid, which is probably true to the degree. But apart from me having one of the lowest range tethers on offer, they still do offer 300, over 300 and 400 mile range cars. But discounting that, you need to think outside of what you already know, which is difficult because the whole refueling concept is an unconscious habit for us and our elders for many decades. So what is the secret to EV range? I agree, range anxiety is absolutely a thing if you're new to electric vehicles. But that's because you're thinking of a full discharge of the battery by going from max charge to 0%. With your petrol or gas car, that is the way you've always operated. Full tank to a quarter tank or near empty tank means time to refill. The amount you fill up per month varies depending on your driving habits. But to put it in a simpler, fairer term, let's say you're, let's say you're an average everyday driver. Did you know the average US driver drives just 30 miles a day? It's even lower in the UK, but would us battery electric vehicle drivers still need to recharge after a day using these stats? Absolutely not. In my Model 3, heck, I could drive over a week before it would deplete to near empty levels, but we don't do that. When the journey is done, we plug in at home and my car is ready for the next journey. Small, consistent top-ups. Heck, I may leave it four or five days before I decide to charge, but it's never inconvenient because my home charger is my own virtual petrol station. So the secret is not to consider your full rated range in miles, but to consider how much mileage a day you'll be doing. 270 miles in a day is a hell of a lot of mileage for an everyday user. And whilst I do appreciate some users do that in over a day, potentially five days a week, I think you'd probably agree that is a niche requirement doing an annual mileage of over 70,000 miles a year. This doesn't represent the average driver representation of 30 miles a day in circa 10,000 miles a year. Bring this back to the core point of BEV versus plug-in hybrid. So right now you might agree with me to a degree. Now you're thinking you need to do this annual road trip to, I don't know, Nanny Bev and Granda Kev's house, which is usually a 300 mile road trip. What do you do here? You, you can't possibly have this daily range mindset anymore, can you? Don't panic. This is normal to feel that range anxiety at first. This is currently inconvenient because you just don't know how to work out the whole charging malarkey and the stopping and the starting and how much it's going to take to charge, etc. But before you skip straight to a plug-in hybrid at this point, my Tesla navigation will just take this whole thing out for me and work it out. To do that, I'm going to use an online tool called A Better Route Planner. You can also download it as an app on your phone. I've spoken about this app before in many different videos, which I'll link on the screen for you. But to summarize the situation, it would take five hours of pure driving to get from Leicester to Glasgow, and that's around 307 miles. Five hours and 22 minutes, including charging time. I'm not sure about you, but five hours is a long time driving. With this, 22 minutes is charging time. I can stop, put the car on charge, take myself and the kids to the toilet, grab a quick snack from the shop, and it's ready to go. 22 minutes isn't wasted time, it's easily filled productively. But best of all, it would cost just over £12 or $17 that includes initial home charging and some supercharger costs to get there. Which leads me to my plug-in hybrid comparison. With a plug-in hybrid, we'll be relying on the petrol and diesel engine, which is what we're used to at the moment. So it is more comfortable because it is what we're used to. When it comes to daily driving, I'd still probably be in the same habit of refueling the car when my tank would be almost empty. I'd probably charge less because realistically, I could be lazy and just rely on that petrol engine instead. But let's say I did charge wherever possible. If I use a BMW 330e as an example, I should expect to get 23 miles of electric range and then 298 miles on petrol according to the EPA estimates on the US Fuel Economy Government website. So with the 30 mile daily range limit, if you did just pure electric, I'd still be dipping it into the petrol consumption on the daily. 
let's say I was achieving the full 30 miles of electric range each day. Car may just cut out of the pure electric mode uh, for any reason. Like if I accelerated too hard, I drove beyond a certain speed limit, I turned on the heating or I turned the air come on. I'd even read that if utilizing the full EV mode for an extended period of time, the fuel can actually degrade in quality over time and the engine may need to bend some fuel as a result. So you can't guarantee you can use the hybrid in its most efficient mode all the time. Using the whole 307 mile trip with a BMW 330e, the battery pack has a 12 kilowatts capacity, so electric costs would be just 60p. But the conventional 40 litre petrol tank at an average UK cost at the moment of £1.28 would total £51.20 or £51.80 including the battery charge cost. So in comparison, I'd pay about £40 more just one way to save just 22 minutes in charging time. For me, I'd rarely do these trips, maybe the occasional 180 to 200 mile trip, but even so, that's just twice a year tops. I'm more than willing to sacrifice a bit of charging time for the monthly cost savings, but being able to stay in full EV mode was important to me. Quick reminder, please remember to support my channel by hitting the like, subscribe button, notification bell, such a quick gesture, it just really helps me out if you enjoy Tesla content like this. So touching briefly on the purchase price differences, I knew a Tesla Model 3 would cost more than most plug-in hybrids, but I also worked out the overrunning costs would be lower than, say, a BMW 330e plug-in hybrid, for which I will detail in full in a separate video. As I understand it, the hybrid vehicles do not qualify for the plug-in grant here in the UK, whereas previously they did qualify. This isn't a massive difference, but every little bit helps, and you know that can affect the numbers. On the market, you may come across mild hybrids, but don't be fooled by the names. These are very much petrol and diesel vehicles still. They hold very small batteries and get their energy from regen braking or just from the petrol and diesel engine itself. So don't be fooled by the name. Burning fuel in the combustion engine to make electric is not as green as you think. Some brands even call this method self-charging, which is just baffling to me. So covering the maintenance and servicing side of things, I was surprised by the difference between the two. So your usual annual service requirement is expected with a plug-in hybrid. With a Tesla Model 3 though, there is no annual servicing requirement. Just a handful of maintenance pointers for which you can complete a majority of them yourself. This compromises of replacing the screen wash, rotating the tyres, changing the cabin filters and potentially draining the brake fluid. You don't need to do this every year either. What deterred me from a full hybrid was the sheer mixture of components. Your conventional combustion engine still needs the same parts as before. Then you have the electric powertrain on top of that. More moving parts ultimately means more friction, more room for issues to occur. When compared to the alternative lighter touch experience, it's a no brainer for me which one was more attractive. So one of the final points that I want to cover is why do plug-in hybrids exist in the first place? I think these cars exist for two distinctive reasons, but to cover one sole purpose. The sole purpose is to meet air quality requirements, but still being able to produce a traditional ICE engine. But to the consumer, it tackles the key perceived problem, and that is range anxiety. This is the consumer's biggest concern, so it ticks that box. But it also allows the automaker to continue to produce ICE engines in the first place, which is what they know best. But then there has to be some compromises to the design to then pack in the battery pack on top. These cars are very much built with an ICE design first and a hybrid design second. So they are designed to fit around the shell of what they already have. I know some battery electric vehicles produced by traditional automakers that do similar things as well though. Say the Kia Enero or the VW Golf E. But the BEVs that do ultimately sell better are actually the vehicles that run on their own dedicated platforms, such as Tesla's, the Renault Zoe, the VW ID3, just to name a few. So by running on a dedicated platform, there are many benefits to the consumer because the design isn't compromised. So with the Mustang Mach-E or a Tesla vehicle, for example, we get a frunk or a front compartment under the bonnet, whereas a Kia e Nero has no frunk because it was built to fit within its ICE design first. Going to the back end of the car for a plug-in hybrid, the boot space can also be a compromised area because of the same issues of having to compromise in design. Using the BMW 330e as an example again, this has around 105 litres less space than its petrol and diesel alternatives of the same car. If this is a family car 
all that space is going to actually add up. The second and final point, I think, is automakers suffer from something called the Osborne effect. If you're wondering what that is, it's a social phenomenon of customers cancelling or deferring orders for the current soon-to-be obsolete product as an unexpected drawback of the company's announcement of a future product prematurely. It's no secret that 9 out of 10 consumers would not go back to an ICE vehicle and even less move back if they own a Tesla. So these automakers know once they get bums in EVs, they sell. They can't just turn off their ICE car sales and move straight into EVs. It takes many years to design a car, get a battery supply and then produce that car. They need to transition, but they can't just introduce an EV in limited supply and say this is the best of them that you can buy from us now because they'll just isolate sales of their existing ICE lineup. They'd be making their ICE cars totally obsolete at this point, and this being the Osborne effect. I think this is partly why they have P- partly why they have plug-in hybrids because it keeps the consumer within the brand and encourages a partial EV powertrain with what they know, in hope that that will tie them over until the automaker has transitioned further into a full EV future. So conclusions. So even though PHEVs are very much their own product, to me. When you get underneath the marketing surface, they just seem like a compromised ice vehicle. I know some of you will still have this range anxiety issue, and even with my help, it's still going to be too much for you to move straight into a battery electric vehicle. I'd much rather you get a plug-in hybrid than to replace your car with another pure ice vehicle. This will act as a short-term stepping stone. But overall, my research of having a dedicated EV was by far the best alternative to a pure ice vehicle. There's a uncompromised design so I get all the storage benefits with the cost advantages of running an EV. When we consider the range, we need to consider range per day rather than range per full capacity. I'd say that's only really an issue if you're consistently doing long range trips. Then again, there are 300 to 400 mile range EVs on the market right now and supercharging can be paired up with a toilet or coffee break so there's no waste of time. Particularly for the masses, an EV makes perfect sense and over the coming years it won't be long before the start of initial purchase costs decrease to even cheaper than a hybrid and full gas alternatives. If you enjoyed this video, I have many more videos focused on my own EV journey so you can get an even greater insight into EV ownership. That's it, now you've been informed on my thoughts of the plug-in hybrid versus battery electric vehicles. Let me know what your thoughts are on this video. Would you now consider a battery electric vehicle over a plug-in hybrid now? Don't forget to support my channel by hitting the like, subscribe and sharing the video with your friends and family. I really enjoyed doing these Tesla vlogs and the support is hugely welcomed by me. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.